Hey folks, David Stewart here. Star Wars, The Last Jedi. It's Thomas Covenant, but he's trapped in Star Wars instead of the land. Instead of it being a fan film, it is a nightmare that is imprisoning somebody who hates Star Wars. I said a lot of this stuff about two years ago, so this is my Last Jedi two years later I guess review or revisiting of some of the ideas after I recently rewatched the movie, which was an interesting experience now that I'm a little bit more separated through time. But before I get to that, I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm going to give you a little anecdote. So back in the eighth grade, I have this memory, very clear. I don't know if you ever had to do this in class, but my English teacher had like a round robin story activity where somebody would write one sentence or maybe two sentences of a story, and then you'd mix up all the all the papers and the next person would get it and write the next part of the story and you'd go on you know go on through that until you ended up with a whole page or a couple pages long story now the thing is because this was mixed up and because it was anonymous who was doing what as you can guess this leaves room for a little bit of trolling especially for 13 year old Stu, um who liked to troll so i got somebody's paper and um i wrote a sentence about uh, stuffing like poopy underwear or something down somebody's throat. Uh, I I wrote a bunch of gross things on a bunch of papers and they got mixed up and the teacher was reading these stories out loud and she didn't read them before she started just reading them out loud. So she's just reading them like verbatim and she gets to that part. And then after I passed it on, other people saw that and laughed. I could hear the snickering as these papers went around the room and started adding more and more stuff that was grosser and grosser, like, you know, periods and, I mean, all kinds of gross stuff. And the teacher read, like, half of it before she got really frustrated and, like, crumpled them all up and threw them in the trash. She's like, this is why we can't do activities like this. I've tried to do something fun for you, you know, and we're all just kind of, you know, 13-year-olds snickering about about how funny it was. It's the, you know, one of those first experiences where I realized, where I realized anonymity and uh, the removal of social consequences or really any consequences for doing things produces some interesting behavior effects. But that's what does this have to do with Star Wars? Well, it's kind of like you created this thing called Star Wars and then you handed it off to somebody to do the next part of it and then they did it and they handed it off to someone else and it gets in the hands of, of Rian Johnson and he's like, oh, I'm going to do some fun stuff with this because... I have it. I can control it. And so he proceeds to uh, create The Last Jedi, which I actually consider not just a hate letter to fans, not just really a hate letter to Star Wars, which is something that I I said a couple years ago, but really a hate letter to J.J. Abrams. That's really what I got out of the second viewing because every single thing J.J. set up, Ryan was very, very careful to fulfill whatever that mystery box was uh, people call it mystery box writing which is where you like you reveal a little detail and you're like oh, wouldn't you like to know the truth about this who were raised parents etc and then later you fill them in and it creates like a shocking reveal it's a way to create a plot point kind of in the future in anticipation for a future reveal so he takes all of those and you know rather than putting something cool inside the mystery box he poops in the box you know and that's that's his that's his way of like uh, saying that he doesn't like what J.J. Abrams gave him. Um, and it's not just a surprise. It's not like he's like, I'm going to do something really surprising. It's like, I'm going to I'm going to poop in this. I'm going to do something that is the opposite of fulfilling. It's just pointless. Every single mystery was just pointless is what he, what he went through. And so every single thing that J.J. set up, that's what he did. It was like he opened up the mystery box and pooped in it. There's a whole bunch of them. First thing is there was no victory for the resistance this is a general thing this wasn't like a mystery box thing but that's what the movie opens up with is now we have to run away even though we blew up this planet-sized battle station they i guess they have a giant fleet that could have wiped us out at any time so we got to go run away we've got to have a little chain of dogs in space it's exactly like the beginning of empire strikes back in fact the entire movie is actually highly derivative of empire strikes back and i'll get to that in the next video the second one is the the degradation and the the humiliation of the character Finn. We see him naked in a bag with water leaking everywhere intended to just 
be comical. This hero is um, leaking fluid everywhere and is naked. It's just a humiliation thing to to make the hero of the story, one of the heroes of the story, into just a nothing. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the things that the the movie I think tries to succeed in doing is to degrade the heroes in various different ways. Here's the first big one though. This is a big mystery box thing that he that he pooped in. Um, Anakin's lightsaber. So we don't know where Anakin's lightsaber came from in The Force Awakens. And J.J. was careful to really build up this lightsaber as it has magical powers. You know, it's granting force visions. It's calling to Rey. It's special. Maz has kept it for special reasons. She's passing it off for special reasons. And we want to know those reasons. We want a, a cool reveal, like I wonder why. It could be anything. I wonder why. I just want to know what the important reason for it was. And so the first thing that happens is there's a crossover from the end scene of Force Awakens. She hands Luke a lightsaber and he looks at the lightsaber and throws it over his shoulder. That to me is like Ryan Johnson saying, screw this whole stupid thing you came up with JJ of like this lightsaber is important I'm throwing it over my shoulder it has some important character implications as well but it's hard to not see the gesture as breaking that fourth wall a little bit kind of saying screw you and if that wasn't enough they had the the lightsaber just get broken in half halfway through the movie or towards the end of the movie thus making sure that uh, JJ couldn't actually fulfill the mystery box that he'd set up in the first movie making damn sure that uh, that little setup was going nowhere it's like he poisoned the ability to any fu- any future filmmaker to do it and I think JJ probably found a way around it because we can see the lightsaber intact in the previews but um, that's what it was he just just to make sure we'll go ahead and break it so nobody else can play with the toy either um, Luke wasn't at the temple for any reason except to die. So this was another mystery box. Why is Luke at this? Luke went away to find this hidden Jedi temple. I wonder why. The reason was no reason. There was no reason. The reason was I wanted to die. Now, if he wanted to die, I guess he could have just killed himself or joined the force, right? Um, then why did he leave a map behind? Well, he doesn't answer that. Instead, again, he just poops in the box. He says, no, I was here to die. I'm not here to continue the Jedi. I won't train you. The Jedi need to die, and I need to die too. There's no reason for me to be here. Um, the next one was the de- the degradation, humiliation, the taunting of Kylo Ren, um, the Ben Solo character. So there's a, a scene where Kylo goes in front of Snoke, and Snoke just dresses him down and ridicules him and makes fun of him nonstop. First, he makes fun of the mask. Take off that ridiculous mask. This is like a little bit of talking through the fourth wall. I don't know if there's a good term for it when you're giving a monologue that the audience is inside on, that it's intended to communicate a secondary, um, you know, a secondary subtle subtext to the audience, but that's what's there. It's basically saying this masked dude was really stupid. Take off your stupid mask and then he taunts him and says you're no darth vader you'll never be a darth vader that's a that's like he's talking to jj abrams and saying you're dumb little villain that you created you're kylo ren your number two sith guy that you created of course i don't think they're really sith but it doesn't matter um you're number two sith guy you're number two lord that you created uh he's stupid so i'm gonna take off his mask and you know what i'm gonna do just to make sure you can't do anything with it i'm gonna have kylo ren smash his mask afterwards so he smashes the mask to pieces just to make sure jj or anyone else who gets this next movie you can't do anything with this stupid mask either you'll never be vader if that's it's just a, a taunting to the to the previous filmmaker is what it feels like um the next one is he ridicules this idea of a dichotomous force of good and evil this is one of the things I talked about with one of my videos on nihilism and the last Jedi two years ago. So Ryan Johnson, Ruin Johnson, he doesn't like the idea of a light side, dark side, or people aligning with good or evil or the various things that the yin and yang of the light side, dark side. And so he has Luke basically speak for him. Luke is almost like a Thomas Covenant like character, which I'll talk about in a second has Luke speak for him and talk about how he just refuses to uh, acknowledge this dichotomy that like, Oh, if the Jedi go away, the light will die. This is vanity. Um, Rather than, adhering to 
the nature of the conflict in the previous seven movies established the nature of the mythology which is that there's a conflict between good and evil that's what the stories are about so he wipes away this concept of good and evil the one of the core philosophical ideas of star wars he decides to to do away with that and he kills all the sith and all the jedi just to make sure he kills snoke and he kills luke and then he has kylo kind of speak for him and say let the past die kill if you have to let's do away without no jedi no sith um he doesn't like this idea of opposing morality because he probably doesn't believe in it he's a nihilist so that by itself just i can't believe that uh they let a filmmaker do that but that's exactly what he did it was to ridicule the people who believe in good and evil which is every person who came before him in the franchise he turns yoda into a troll this is a subtle thing and a silly thing but yoda only puts on that troll act to as a as a front to luke and then he's otherwise a wise sage he has a cheerful side to him he has a a cheerful side to him even in the pre in the in the prequels but he's not a buffoon so of course he ridicules yoda by turning him into like the court jester and making him tease uh luke for being a failure and for um you know not reading the jedi text it, it again it's about humiliating luke you want to humiliate the heroes so they start with the humiliation of finn and of course they humiliate luke as well and he also does I guess Ray's the only one who doesn't really get significantly humiliated. He humiliates Kylo Ren. It's about humiliation of every character, um, especially every male character. There's this reveal. I wonder. Why, I wonder why Luke got rid of his training thing. What happened to it? How did Kylo destroy it? How did all this come out? What's in this mystery box? And his thing was, oh well, Luke was going to murder Kylo Ren, thus justifying what Kylo did. Kylo was acting kind of in self defense. And it looks like I had a moment of weakness and then everything blew up, but I saw this great darkness within Kylo, which means Kylo Ren was going to the dark side for no reason. We had very good reasons for Darth Vader turning to the dark side in the prequels. It was a long journey of pain and hatred that brought him finally to the dark side. But uh, for Kylo, it's just, I don't know, it just kind of happened. It's an automatic thing that you're dark side or light side. And I'll get to that um, with my last point. Um, we have a reveal here of who is Ray. You know, well, Ray's parents have to be somebody important. I wonder who they are. I wonder if it's, is it going to be Luke? It's like, is it's Luke's daughter and he hid her from Kylo? Or is it like, what's the, what's the story going to be? We can think of lots of different possibilities. All the kinds of fan theories came out around the time of Force Awakens. Well, the answer was Ray is nobody. There's nothing, you know, it's another poop in the box thing. She was a child of somebody who sold her for booze money and died alone in a marked grave. Uh, you're nobody. You have no place in this story. You're nothing, but not to me. Um, that's, again, one of these things where you're having a monologue, but you're actually communicating, communicating something that's author-centered. Just like, you're nobody, but not to me. Like, I care about this character, and I want this character to be good, independent of some sort of family legacy. That's him really communicating something to the audience about what he thinks about what J.J. set up and what uh, Star Wars is. It's a hate letter to the franchise that he's operating in, just right there. This idea that uh, family lineage matters because it's always mattered in the previous, the previous movies. And lastly, he turns the Force from a skill or knowledge. You know, I see... You know, I see your knowledge of the Force is as strong as mine. You know, we'll have to settle this with lightsabers or something like that. You know, the knowledge of the Force or the skill of the Force that, you know, your competency is a result of years of training and meditation and wisdom and, and gaining wisdom to understand the Force to be powerful. This is why Yoda is so powerful is he's had hundreds of years of experience to learn about this. Turns it from a skill or a knowledge into a power that anyone can have. Notice Kylo becomes a dark side, ultra powerful force user for no reason. You know, he doesn't learn it. He just has it. Ray doesn't learn it. She just has it. And uh, that's, that's kind of a big one because I don't know, that's something that I guess Ryan Johnson wanted was for the force to not be something that's a result of merit, but something that happens automatically. And we can see the hint at the end of the at the end of the movie that he just thinks every, everyone can be special and everyone can use the force which basically means that he doesn't believe in any kind of 
uh, either merit through uniqueness or merit through practice. You know, um, there's a there's a signal there. So that's what he did. He opened up all the boxes and he pooped them. Now I mentioned Thomas Thomas Covenant. Now when I watched this movie the first time, I felt like I was watching some kind of bizarre Star Wars dream, a Star Wars nightmare. The aesthetics were all weird dreamlike perversions of uh, The Empire Strikes Back, um, all copied from The Empire Strikes Back, but with like a copy error, like the walkers have knuckles or something, you know? Everything has like one detail altered from what you saw before, making it feel very dreamlike. Um, very pronounced use of the color red, just like in Empire Strikes Back, which I'll probably talk about in the future. And I I actually went home after watching it the, when it came out, and I had like weird dreams about Star Wars, like Star Wars nightmares. And so I kind of, I think I might've said this, like it's like a Star Wars nightmare. But what it kind of feels like is it's it's some inversion of this fan film, fan fantasy thing that we had in Force Awakens, where Force Awakens was about these two characters going through a Star Wars adventure and enjoying and having all the experiences that a Star Wars fan would fantasize about having in the Star Wars world. Meeting that cool rogue Han Solo flying the Millennium Falcon, using lightsabers against stormtroopers, all of that stuff just reeks of fan fantasy. This is like the opposite. This is like he's trapped in a world that he doesn't want to be in, that he doesn't believe in. He doesn't like what makes up the world. So it's very reminiscent to me of Thomas Covenant. And if you've never seen any of my Thomas Covenant videos, you know, please go watch them. It's a very interesting fantasy series. Um, it's, it has some very, very interesting things to say. Um, and I actually have become kind of an unwilling fan of Thomas Covenant, Thomas Covenant books over the years um, and Stephen R. Donaldson because of this weird, uh, very hateable character and his basically being worn down and turned into a hero against his will. Uh, and so I think Luke is kind of the author's mouthpiece more than anyone in this. Uh, Kylo, I mean, they're all mouthpieces of the author. This is a problem with writing, by the way, guys, just as a little side note. Your characters ought not be mouthpieces for your ideas. They need to be speak their own ideas, speak the ideas that are true to the universe that you've constructed. This is not the case with The Last Jedi. It's one of the big problems with it. Um, but Luke is basically trapped in a world that he doesn't believe in and doesn't like. Uh, this is why he says Luke Skywalker, the legend. He ridicules himself. Why would he ridicule himself? It's not him ridiculing himself. It's Ryan Johnson ridiculing the idea of Luke Skywalker, the idea of a cosmic hero, of an eternal champion. He hates that idea. Just as in uh, Thomas Covenant, Thomas Covenant hates the idea of being asked to be a hero. Everybody's trying to push him to use his power for good, and he's always refusing to use his power. He's always refusing to do the right thing, and eventually he has to do the right thing. Eventually he does the right thing basically out of some compulsion, and indeed we see Luke Skywalker does the right thing kind of at the end of the movie, even though we kill him just to make sure that nobody can, JJ can't use Luke Skywalker anymore after this, or, you know, you can't have any more Luke Skywalker in Star Wars after this. Um, he's kind of put in motion to finally do something correct. Um, and of course, with Thomas Covenant, he hates the world. Um, he feels like he's walking through a nightmare. He hates what's being asked of him. He doesn't believe the world exists, just as Ryan Johnson does not believe Star Wars exists and doesn't believe in the things which make up the Star Wars. He doesn't believe in the philosophy that inspires people about it. He, this is why he communicates a nihilistic message. So just like Thomas Covenant, he hates that. And more than anything, he hates himself. That is why Luke Skywalker hates himself. It's because Ryan Johnson hates Luke Skywalker. And that's about all I have to say about that. It was a very interesting second viewing. Give me your thoughts down below about the philosophy behind what I've talked about. I'll have a by the numbers review following this one up where I'll go through all the categories and we'll take a look at some of the th things like aesthetics and other categories and see how it did with those. But um, I wanted to basically communicate this. It was about... Um, not just hating Star Wars, but hating what J.J. Abrams handed to him um, and what all the previous filmmakers handed to him. Um, truly, it was it felt spiteful and, uh, and hateful the second time I watched it. Anyway, let me know what you think down below. Um, new books are out. Newest one is Eyes in 
The Walls. This is a horror book. Rather interesting one. Um, I think some people are having trouble reading it because it reminds them too much of their childhood, which I'm sorry for. Um, City of Silver, that's my newest fantasy book. I call this like 310 to Yuma, but fantasy. It's got guns and some other fun stuff. People are really liking this one, and I hope you'll like it too. And this has been the, the favorite book this year for most people, Voices of the Void. This is I call this Aliens Meets Lovecraft. This came out over the summer. So this is a quick two-hour read. You can read it in the time that you would watch a bad Star Wars movie. So instead, you can read my book and check it out and see if you like it. It's called Voices of the Void. And lastly, before New Year's tolls, you can get the Fantasy Christmas Spectacular, which will have all the books except for Eyes in the Walls, which came out after this. Um, so it has 10 books in it. And this giant volume includes like huge maps and, and stuff like that. Oops, I guess I transitioned here. There's a cool cover of it. Um, includes lots of cool things there. So check that out. Fantasy Christmas Spectacular. It's 20 bucks. $20.19 for the 2019 edition or $9.99 for the ebook. And get a great deal there, hopefully. So thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Don't forget to join my list, dvspress.com slash list, or just check out my blog, dvspress.com. See you next time.